If you're listening to this, you obviously like podcasts and you're probably like music too. Well, on Spotify, you can listen to all of that in one place for free and you don't even need a premium account. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the one you're listening to right now. On Spotify, you can follow your favorite podcast so you never miss an episode, download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are, easily share what you're listening to with your friends via Spotify's integrations with social platforms like Instagram. Just search for best practices in HR on the Spotify app or browse podcasts in your your library tab and follow me so you never miss an episode of best practices in HR. Spotify is the world's leading music stream service and now it can be your go-to for podcasts too. Hello and welcome back to the Best Practices in Human Resource podcast. We're here to help you take the guesswork out of understanding the human resource component and push through the ambiguity of this changing landscape. I'm Brenda, your host and a 20-year human resource professional. I've seen a lot of different things done a lot of different ways and I'm here to help you weed through the abyss of human resource information and help take the stress out of defining your best practices. So who is this podcast for? Well, it's anyone who's in a position of managing human capital in a micro, small, or growing business. There's a great deal of compliance that needs to be met, and having the information and that guidance to implement it (coughs) month over month is key. If this is your first time joining us, we've got great content that will help you move your HR infrastructure forward. If you're coming back, thank you so much for your continued support. Let's get to it. So today in the studio, we've got Lola, my veteran comfort dog, who may be chiming in periodically, and her assistant, Champ, the Wonder Dog. But most importantly, we are going to talk about today <clears throat> hot topic that's coming up in the courts. Um, pretty interesting thing. Uh, really looking forward to getting into that. Uh, some employment law changes that are happening across the nation. We've also got poster changes uh, to announce for 2019 and something very special. Today's main topic we're going to discuss is how to effectively lead and manage a problematic top performer. And I have a guest today who I'm really excited to introduce you to. Um, At the end, we're also going to, once again, ante up um, a free resource, uh, something that's going to be very powerful and useful um, that I really get excited to share with you guys. Um, The information available through this podcast is really for informational purposes and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. You should contact your attorney to obtain legal guidance with any respects to any particular issue. If you don't have an employment attorney, you're more than welcome to reach out to us and we'll definitely refer you to one through our affiliates program. So moving on to today's hot topic. <clears throat> Um, this is actually something that's probably going to pop up into the Supreme Court. Um, at the end of the month of November, there was a brief that was delivered, and um, this is really fascinating. I've always enjoyed studying case studies. I think that they're very important into understanding um, how things happen in the field of HR as our world continues to evolve and change. And in particular, this case um, is called EEOC versus RNG and GNR Harris Funeral Homes Incorporated. Now, before I get into this, I want to really reiterate that what this is, this case study that we're looking at, is purely an objective viewpoint of a changing landscape. If this goes through, this is probably going to be a landmark case. This isn't, I'm not about taking a platform or a stand on anything political, anything heated. All I'm looking at in this episode and and actually what we do within this podcast is not the heated debate behind the topic itself, but how is that going to affect you and your organization? How is that going to affect small businesses as a whole and work companies and employment in general? And that really is the, the purpose behind this. So, so let me get into some of the details for you. Um, <clears throat> in July 2013, a funeral director in Michigan announced that he will be making the transition to become a female and would be dressing in the appropriate women's attire at work. Two weeks later, she was terminated and was told that her actions were unacceptable. There's a portion of the summary details in the brief that I'm going to read to you. 
kind of gives you a, a very you know high level on the wave tops understanding of what this case is actually about. The employee filed a complaint with the Equal Opportunity Commission, which investigated the employee's allegations that she had been terminated as a result of an unlawful sexual discrimination. During the course of its investigation, the EEOC learned that the funeral home provided its male public-facing employees with clothing that complied with the company's dress code, while female public-facing employees received no such allowance. The EEOC subsequently brought suit against the funeral home in which the EEOC charged the funeral home with violating Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by one, terminating the employee's employment on the basis of her transgender or transitioning status and her refusal to conform to sex-based stereotypes, and number two, administering a discriminatory clothing allowance policy. Well, the reason why this hot topic is bringing coming forward on the show, because it's just fascinating to begin with, but like I said, if this case goes to the Supreme Court, it may very well become that landmark case that will make a significant change to the intentions to Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 at the federal level. A decision in favor of the EEOC will push the landscape of discrimination in HR forward into literally a new era. Um, I have read the entire brief submitted on, on November 30th. Um, it's very, very fascinating. And we're interested to hear what you have to say. Um, so we're going to be taking a poll on this. So we want to hear what you think or what you believe the outcome, the end outcome of this will actually be. Um, this is also kind of fun and exciting. Is when I was in sixth grade social studies class, we learned how important, you know, how to understand polls, where they were, you know, how they're built, how they're contrived, and how to, you know, go about, you know, interpreting the, the responses. This one's very simple, right? Very easy format. <clears throat> we're not collecting any personal information, so we're not going to add you to a list. We're not going to push your name out there. Um, you know, we're just asking basically two questions, and that is, what do you think the outcome will be, and did you have a chance to research the brief before actually answering the questions? So, here's how you can find everything that you need. I gave you the title. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you again. You're welcome to go ahead and log on to our website at bestpractices.work and click on the poll link up at the very top where you'll be able to go ahead and complete your uh, poll online and give you your information and your answer. Again, the name of this is EEOC versus R and G, that's R ampersand G, the word and, G ampersand R, Harris Funeral Homes Incorporated. So we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say about that. Employment law changes across the nation. Okay, we've got some new things, uh, about four things that have popped out um, over the past couple of weeks. So uh, some pretty interesting stuff. So New Suffolk County, New York has introduced a bill banning uh, salary history inquiries. Uh, basically what they're looking for is that there's a significant showing county changes beyond the state and the federal level. Um, they have also uh, now have added to a growing number of counties in the state including New York City, Albany County, Westchester County, and Suffolk County that have taken action in this area as well. Um, again, this is kind of interesting because we've got a state that's taking action in several counties versus just, you know, one whole united front as a, a state itself. And basically part of the reason why, you know, we're sharing this and, and well, actually one of the reasons why we share employment law changes across the nation is that our audience does touch, you know, all 50 states and all the territories. But it's also to elaborate that, you know, employment law becomes even more challenging to keep up with. So the more information that, you know, we can certainly be a part of getting out there, the better off it helps you guys out. Also, in New York City, effective January 3rd, 2019, a new law has been passed that the rideshare drivers are able to earn a minimum wage. This is huge. Um, this is the first time um, 
anything has been uh, enacted in a gig economy in relation to employment law or any type of you know wage uh, wage regulation of any kind um, gig economy is, is kind of a fascinating economy. It's, you know, like when Facebook came out, there was nothing else like it. Uh, or MySpace came out, there was nothing else like it. And, you know, social media all of a sudden, you know, was the big boom. That was the next big thing. And gig economy is kind of that way. It, it's such a, it's such a, you know, came out as totally blue ocean and it continues to grow and it continues to evolve and become very complex. So um, it's definitely an, an evolving economy that's positively impacting uh, our nation. And uh, def we're going to see more changes um, that are going to be continuing to happen as we tap into its potential. Uh, Oregon, state of Oregon, has published a final rule in regards to its Equal Pay Act. So effective January 1st, the state will begin enforcing the ban on making salary history inquiries as well. So again, very sensitive topic about doing any type of preliminary search into an individual salary history during the actual interviewing process. Um, employees and applicants may not pursue any legal action against a potential employer or an employer until after January 1st, 2019. So the final ruling came out, but if there's anybody out there <clears throat> or if you're anticipating anybody, um, you know, hitting you up for something like that, then that's not going to, they're not going to be able to do anything about it until after the first of the year. And then finally down in Texas, um, the third court of appeals has ruled that Austin's paid sick leave ordinance is actually unconstitutional against Texas's constitution and it is preempted by the Texas Minimum Wage Act. So again, you know, we we want to pop this information out there because small businesses, you know, it, you may have one person that's doing multiple roles and one including the HR front, but they don't necessarily have the ability to keep their fingers on the pulse of all of these different changes. So what does that mean when you do have a change? Well, when you have a change, it means you, ha you have to adhere to it, <laughs> very simply put. And if you don't understand it, you can go ahead and do a couple things. First off, you can you know start doing your own private individual research. It could get a little complex, especially if you don't have enough of a historical background on the federal side and the state um, understanding. And you're also able to go ahead and reach out to us. We're, we're happy to help out as much as we possibly can. We'd love to hear from you. And, um, you know, please keep us in mind when you're trying to sort through these types of things because that's what we do. That's what we're here for. Okay, poster changes. <clears throat> I know this is really exciting stuff, right? But um, poster changes, very important. Um, you know, Department of Labor, um, state level unemployment commissions, you know, they, these folks can walk into your offices at any point in time. And, you know, look, having your posters up to date, this is an easy win, folks. This is like really low hanging fruit. Um, if you don't have your posters up, that's like, you know, learning your ABCs of HR management. So um, if you are in the following states, you are going to want to order new posters if that go into effect January 1. More than likely, is, uh, if you order posters today, you're going to have the appropriate um, date, but you can also reach out to the company that you are ordering from and they'll be happy to tell you if, um, more than likely that's probably what it's going to be. So, so listen up folks. All right. Here you go. If your state is called, you're going to want to order posters ASAP. California, Maine, Washington, Arkansas, Missouri, Arizona, Vermont, South Dakota, Minnesota, Massachusetts, Alaska, Delaware, Florida, and Ohio. And the biggest drive behind why all of these states have changes is that they all have an adjustment to the minimum wage. So make sure you folks have the right posters up in your office. In addition to that, if you are a government contractor, and that means that you go out and bid, <clears throat> win, and, and are awarded contracts, then you also need to get the federal contractor poster in addition to your federal and your state posters as well 
because that federal um, minimum wage for government contractors has increased as well going into January 1, 2019. So make sure that you guys jump on that. You get your posters taken care of. And you should be good to go running into, uh, running into the new year. All right, so main topic for today. This is pretty cool stuff. I've been thinking about this for a little while. Um, it, it pops up periodically when I've been working with my clients. I've seen it a number of times over my career. And I'm very fortunate to bring in a good friend of mine, uh, business partner, and a gentleman that I actually was part of his transition from active service into uh, civilian workforce. And um, he is a retired Navy SEAL. He's going to be joining us here in a little bit. He and I got a chance to talk uh, offline and remotely the other week, uh, last week. And so um, we're going to be hearing what he has to say about this. But basically what we're talking about today is how to, effect lead, uh, how to effectively lead and manage a problematic top performer. So, you know, everybody has a top performer in your workplace and, and you just can't not have a workforce without some form of conflict. It's just not going to happen. Uh, no matter how much you want to keep things nice and rosy and believe that your workforce gets along well, every now and again, stuff is going to come up. We're all human. So we're going to look at how to lead and manage a problematic top performer from two different angles. So the first one I'm going to talk about with you and that is you are the established leader and you have a new employee um, who's either earmarked as a top performer or rises to the very, uh, very top quickly and is starting to demonstrate some challenges. The second half of this, which we're going to talk to Jim about today, uh, this afternoon, is that you are the leader entering into a group where there's a problematic top performer. So basically, you're the new kid on the block, and now you've just adopted a real challenge. And Jim's got a significant amount of experience with that over the years, and um, really, really good advice. So when so let's talk about the first one. <clears throat> you are an established leader and you have a new employee, either somebody who's rising to the top, or you have a you know, current employee who came into the team, has been on the team, doesn't matter, but you have somebody who's rising and or you have somebody that's come in that, you know, you, it's like, Oh yeah, this guy's you know, this he's he's on it, he's hot or she's on it, she's hot, she's gonna be this and then all of a sudden you quickly learn that there's some behaviors there that are gonna be, you know, troublesome for you. So one of the very first best practices that you could put into place, but be, you know what, before I even do that, make sure that you realize that top performers can't be managed the same as others. Now, that doesn't mean that you treat them differently from anyone or they live by a completely different set of rules. That's not what I'm referring to. It means that you have to address them in a very unique manner that drives productivity with little issue. It means that you're going to have to lead, not manage. And those are two totally separate um, definitions, right? So back to my first best practice, you're going to want to set expectations from the very first day or from day one when you start to see undesired behaviors that are starting to crop up. If you don't do this and you let it get bigger, it's going to be a bigger mountain to climb. When you're talking to them, you want to be very clear about what your expectations are. Be clear about their role and, and what they actually contribute to the organization or to the company. Just make sure that you do something very important. You don't talk down to them. Don't treat them like they're a child. Don't talk to them in a manner that is intended to squash their ego or to bring that ego down. And I know that's going to be kind of challenging and that's how you're going to be perceived. So you're going to have to really think about how you're going to address this. And I'm going to borrow this really awesome phrase from one of my best friends and that is you really need to meet them where they are. So if they are up above, right? If they're up in the clouds, you're going to have to get up there and get up into the clouds and bring them to your level, or you're going to have to work with them to reestablish them. And it's easier to rein somebody in than it is to build somebody up, okay? Or if you have somebody that's really not quite, you know, they're really not down or up, but they're like far left field or far right field, you're going to have to get them realigned. So you're going to have to meet them where you are. But one way to do that is to definitely invite them to the table to help solve problems. 
these guys, these folks that are top performers <clears throat> need that, they need something to grab onto, okay? And it's it's not always ego, it's just they just have a very different way of looking at things. They can see something efficiently. They can see something that, how they can cut through the process, right? So bring them, bring them to the table and have them sit down and help you figure out, you know, some challenges. How do we deal with a problem employee or how do we deal with a challenging, you know, client? You know, we got to save this, we got to save this deal. How are we going to do that, right? <clears throat> Independence. If they're starting to show a need for independence, give them autonomy, but make sure that you set some boundaries. Make sure that when you do set boundaries, that you set very clear boundaries. Right? And when you do set them, make sure you set them with that person so that they're mutually agreed upon. Now, boundaries sometimes are going to have to flex. Okay, They can't be rigid because remember, you're dealing with a top performer. Rigidity doesn't work very well. So boundaries can be moved, but make sure that you monitor some of those activities so that when boundaries do need to flex and stretch and breathe, it's happening with your blessing and your approval and that it's clearly stated that it, this is the exception and not the rule. So you don't have somebody that's going to, you give them an inch and then they take a mile kind of a situation. You want to make sure that they fully understand that I'll do this one time. Here's the reason why. <clears throat> You know, if, if you're in a similar situation again, you need to get with me before we, we do anything like this in the past, in, in the future. Okay? Take into consideration what kind of solutions they're offering. Okay? If you don't or if you can't apply them at that moment when they're talking about, when you're kind of working with their independence, make sure that you help them understand why. All right? A lot, sometimes people have a tendency to believe that, you know, solutions are financially reliant and that companies have very deep pockets, right? Sometimes a solution isn't always financially reliant. Sometimes it's creative. Sometimes it's just having the right conversation. Sometimes it's just taking a different action. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to involve spending money. And hopefully if we're smart enough, um, we'll be able to avoid it. But sometimes you can't, right? But if it is, you know, sometimes, you know, help me, help that underplay understand that some suggestions that can't be financially supported now, but they might be in the future. Um, when you give that kind of feedback to an individual who's anning up solutions, you're not going to smush them. You're not going to bring them down by saying, I really like this. Unfortunately, right now, this is not something that we're going to support. I'm going to keep this in mind because I really do like it. And my goal is to actually figure out a way in a day that we can put that into place. And when we do put it into place, I'm going to have to rely on you. But I don't know when that's going to be. Something very straightforward. And they'll totally respect that. And then finally, next best practice, rein them in. <clears throat> and rein them in if you see them starting to stretch those boundaries. Or rein them in if they're starting to turn left or right or, you know, go back into the clouds again. Okay. So particularly surrounding process, policy, and procedure. Those types of things impact the whole team. And top performers are no different in the execution of business operations. Before you try and sit there and sell them on the what's in it for me angle, like if you do this, here's what's going to happen. You know, if you do this, this is what you're going to get out of it. You got to be really, really careful <clears throat> and be certain that you understand this position, this person and what motivates them and why they're not willing to adhere to what it is that you're trying to provide them or why they're not adhering to that SOP, right? If you try and sell them on the with them and it is not the right button, you are going to lose respect very quickly. They're going to look at you like you're a joke. <laughs> we don't want that. They're going to look at you like, you know, you're just, you're floundering, you don't know what you're doing, which quite frankly means that you don't know how to lead that person. So you really need to take time to get to know these individuals very well at a different level than most other individuals so that way you can effectively move forward with them down the path when you need to. Um, you know, they're not your average employee. They can't be managed as everyone else. These guys need to be led. So that's what I have for you on this segment of where, again, you're the leader that's established. 
new person coming in or you know, you know a rising star. So we're going to change over here real quickly. Um, we're going to bring Jim into this. Jim recently retired in 2018 after a full naval career which provided him the honor of serving in the SEAL teams for 27 years of which 15 as a tier 1 elite warrior. He has deployed 18 times to various countries supporting hundreds of missions globally. He served as a squadron master chief, an operations master chief for a 2,000 member command, and finally as the training master chief overseeing leadership and training for the East Coast Bay SEAL teams. Jim has exceptional leadership skills in creating and leading elite teams and projects while seeing them through to their completion. In 2017, he wrote the SEAL SOP handbook outlining roles and responsibilities of both junior and senior leaders, as well as describing some basic procedures that should be common knowledge to SEALs on both coasts. This book is now being issued to all new graduating SEALs as they enter the SEAL teams after completion of their qualification training. Folks, please welcome Jim Foreman. And we are here with Jim Foreman. Um, on location and in the studio with us, you can probably hear in the background is Lola, the veteran comfort dog that comes with me from time to time. So um, they're all joining us today. How are you? Doing good. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for thanks for spending some time. Yeah, appreciate it. No this is awesome. So you and I have had a lot of conversations around problematic top performers, and with your background, I'm. Pretty sure you run into a few. <laughs> You're in your 27 years of service. So I just got done talking about the top, the some of the best practices for you know as you're a, a leader, an established leader, and you have a new person coming in that's definitely showing that they are probably going to be a top performer. You know how you keep them on track, and yet how you keep them engaged and still you know the best you can enjoying the job. I'd like to flip the tables a little bit and talk more about what it's like when you are the new leader coming in and now you're walking to an environment where you have a real problematic employee, top performer. Like in, in your past, no doubt you've run into that. Correct. Yeah, I'm sure. So talk to me about some of the things that you've done in the past. Like what kind of recommendations they can make? If you the top recommendation you can make, what would it be? Yeah, the top recommendation is not to uh, uh, listen to the input that you're getting and take it for uh, what it's worth. Because what you need to do is once you get into that job, you need to settle down. You put out your guidance, your uh, little speech you're going to give out to everybody. Mm -hmm. You don't sing out the person that everybody's been talking about. Because it could be that one person is the correct person and he's just mm -hmm. making everybody else look bad. Uh, <laughs> or he could just be the problem guy that everybody's talking about. So you need to uh, get the word out and then you just need to sit back and watch yeah. and counsel uh, everybody, not just the one person. And then over time, you'll see what the truth is. Yeah. Yeah. So when you've got, I mean, I can understand one or two people, you definitely want to sit back and let, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's two sides of every story and the truth lies always somewhere in between. But when you've got a number of people and it's very overwhelming, it seems to me, especially in my past, it seems, it's always seemed to me that that's probably the actual case versus not. Maybe you've seen something different. I don't know. I have seen something different. So I've seen uh, it's almost like a feeding frenzy because mm -hmm. you have everybody's a top performer, right? Um, in some units, right? So sometimes it's just not a good fit. And if you get somebody that's not a good fit, the other sharks will nip at them and they'll even make up stories or exaggerate stories. And then some people don't even know what the situation is. And just because other people are talking bad about that person, they'll join in. And so there's a a stereotype people start labeling to this person. Mm -hmm. And so that's like a cancer. Yeah. And so uh, that's what happened with me. I showed up and there was one person um, that was trying to kick out and it was, you know, pretty, pretty bad. So I had to settle everything out. And then the truth was there was actually five people that were at fault. And some of the people that started the rumors were the worst ones. <laughs> so 
uh, eventually I did move that person out because there was no possible way that I could correct what was being done to him. Right. And there were some personality issues, um, which I figured was the fit part. Mm -hmm. So I got him out and got him a better chance at a different SEAL team with some progression because he was not going to get progression uh, at that team. It, so we did a, back in November for Veterans Day, we did a, a presentation to an HR group of professionals um, and we talked about how you had mentioned that sometimes it's like you look if you see somebody that's not that's not doing something correct you have to correct them you, you have to make sure that you know they're on the right path and and you know and if they're not then shame on you that's a fault for your situation you're talking about this top this you know high performer even though he had you know five guys ganging up on him was this person ever adjusted or corrected um, that you know? Not really. It was at the time the senior person uh, had never really observed to make a correct adjustment, mm. right? So it was just believing the rumors and then counseling that person based on the rumors. Mm -hmm. And so when the person would uh, disagree, it was more like just disobedience. Yeah. So it all goes into, you know, a senior leader really needs to know their people, know their culture and know the situation and you can't do that by sitting behind a desk yeah. your whole career you need to get out you need to uh if there's training going on you need to be involved in the training if it's two weeks of training you only need to be out there for two days you know but just to hit the different things that's going on and make an appearance and get to know people by name it, the worst thing you could do is not know by name the people that you're working with mm -hmm. or that work for you because mm -hmm. they know you yeah um, and when you don't know them, it, it's not good camaraderie. Yeah. So the guy, again, going back to the guy real quick, did he ever convey to you um, at any point in time like a level of frustration? It's like, you know, dude, I'm busting my butt here and I'm just getting, I'm just taking heavies. Yeah. So the first thing I did was um, I moved him to a different troop. Right. And I talked to that troop chief and I said, hey, we're going to give this guy a fair shot. I'm going to get him out of the, the one troop and get him in a different troop. And uh, he did well. He did really well. And that troop chief was aware of issues. And he said, hey, there's, he's busting his butt. So it kind of disquelled what was being said about him. Uh, and again, a, a lot of the people that were making up these stories or talking about these stories had already left. And then... The ones that were still there, it was more like a rumor mill that they heard that this guy had done this or something that yeah. wasn't approved or whatever. And it was really just poor leadership on their part because they never counseled him yeah. on these. And I guess if they would have asked him, they would have found out that, okay, this is why he did this. It was because of this. Yeah. And uh, so that's what I was doing. I was investigating deeper and I found out the truth and it was there was actually five people at fault wow. for everything that happened. So then I ended up eventually getting the guy out after six months of this and then counseling, um, written counseling on three individuals and verbal counseling with two others. Mm. Wow. Yeah, isn't it amazing what you learn when you just ask the questions? Yeah. You find out a lot. But it also for, you know, I learned this when I was a young uh, SEAL was seeing... Um, People make assumptions. And Big then, time. And then just do a knee jerk, right? And when you're dealing with a bunch of top performers, they're all grown men, you know, <laughs> and they, they're not 19 year olds. No. So they see right through this smoke screen of somebody just knee jerking and just reacting and then getting on to the next problem. It's like, okay, yo, great leader. Yeah. They didn't even know what happened, wow. or they didn't even ask. And, th and then that's when the squeaky wheel comes to play. They find out pretty quick that, hey, if I'm a squeaky wheel, I could get to the top leader, complain first, and then my story sticks. Right. And then it takes sometimes uh, weeks to get the truth out. And by then it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. So what about a time, like, so what, what would your next, what, what would be your next best practice then? So that was a pretty good one. Um, well, there was kind of like two best practices. One, if you when you come in, mm -hmm. just to reiterate this, when you come in, you just want to sit, listen, and not take uh, all these assumptions for truth and figure it out for yourself. Uh, the number two best practice is to train with them, uh, no matter what job you have, to uh, show yourself and to integrate yourself into 
problems, problem solving events and things like that. So you can see how the person's, how everybody's interacting. Mm-hmm. Because uh, uh, if you don't see that, it's not going to help. Uh, another best practice is give guidance to your senior leaders that work for you. So for me, I had three troop chiefs mm-hmm. at this time. So they're in charge of a troop of guys. And so when I tell them, hey, guys, this is what I need. This is what I expect of you. This is what you should expect of me. I'm going to be bouncing around here and there, but I need to find, I don't want any of this, this, and that. Yeah. And then they, if they're solid guys, which that's why they're there, right? You need to entrust them to do that job Mm -hmm. and then to fix problems themselves. So what you don't want to do, you want to give them guidance and give them enough leeway to say, Hey, if you can fix a problem without telling me, that's great. But if it gets to a certain level, and then you can come tell me. And I'll never say, why didn't you tell me about this six months ago? Because I know you have been trying to deal with it. So hopefully I would see this on this date you verbally counsel this person. On this date you give them a written counseling. And on this date, whatever, you gave them a violation, right? Yeah. And now I'm bringing it to you, Jim. And so that's a good history for me to go off of. Okay, wow, so you've done your job. And now I got to figure out what I'm going to do. Right. That's cool. So when you when you bump into a, a top performer, <clears throat> and I don't know what your take is on this, but I, it there's on the outward appearance <clears throat> seems to be a level of arrogance, which I, I think that has to exist somewhat for somebody to punch through, you know, some of the barriers that they have to get through in order to be successful, whether it be in sales, whether it be in marketing, or whether it be in business development or something or even in the teams, right, to where there has to be a, a you have to produce a result of some kind, right? Because <clears throat> it's not always easy, and you either have what it takes to get through and make that happen, or you, or you bounce off of the barrier. So, so I think there does have to be a small element of arrogance in there, because you do have to make some things happen. You have to have the right, you know, punchy attitude for it. However, it, there is, there are times where it seems that there's more arrogance than what there is. And that could just be in the eyes of the beholder. Um, I know a long time ago, I was a top performer in one of my jobs, um, you know, cared a lot about what was going on with the customer every single time, recognized, you know, that, hey, listen, yeah, the company's, you know, certain aspects of the service are at fault. And so I would kind of charge inward just a little bit, probably a little harder, to get to the end result or to make sure because I didn't want to lose that customer. I didn't want to lose the customer because we screwed something up. Or somebody would come and ask me my opinion or advice on something and I would give it to them. And people who didn't know me or didn't work with me, I would often get the feedback that I was arrogant. Right. So there's a difference between arrogance and confidence. Mm-hmm. And I think in your case, you're more confident. Yeah. And some people are offended by, you know, the, your confidence because you're you're good at your job you have the answers <laughs> and it's based on experience so it's good right um, arrogance to me is somebody that just rolls your eyes at you when you're telling them that, uh, that this is your project or something like that and to me like true arrogance when I see that is really to me they're bored mm. they're working below their level so if I have an arrogant uh, person leader I usually will obviously will talk to them but then I'll stack responsibility on them I'll give them more responsibility and that usually levels them out because number one they want more responsibility usually mm. or if they're just that bad if they're a rotten apple you need to get rid of them right um, but in my the situations I've been in usually they're bored they're not challenged and they need more responsibility that's good and if you don't know how to challenge them you got to start asking somebody, you got to start, you know, partnering up with somebody to help figure out, it's like, hey, I got this guy, how, how can I challenge this person? Because, you know, I've run into situations like some of the, the customers that I've talked to in the past, they may not have anything that they can challenge that person with from a task oriented perspective, right? They're doing everything that they're supposed to do. There is no additional task you can give them. But I told them, I said, well, why don't you give them something to learn? 
and something to master that's going to help you move your business forward. Either a new piece of technology or have them research something, you know, they, they have an idea about something, you know, let, let, just let the dogs out. Yeah. And you have to be careful about that by assigning yeah. them, uh, Hey, I want you to learn code or something like that. Cause if there's no end game for them and they, okay, I'm going to learn, I'm going to spend six months learning code for what? So it's right. good to give them, um, Hey, this is where I see you right. in the future. And, but you need to accomplish these things and I could see you yeah. being this person. Cause then they're going home and they're thinking, wow, I, Somebody's actually looking at my future. Vice, I'm just coming in every day, and that's kind of where the arrogance comes in play. Is like, yeah, this is day in status quo work. Yeah. And the top performers don't like status quo work. No, they don't. So have. you want to provide them with something more and give them that counseling, like you know, every three months, every quarter, to let them know how they're doing, what they're doing good, what they're doing bad, uh, what, how you see them progressing, and giving them an honest feedback, and then getting some of their feedback to you of how the rest of the teams doing is pretty important important yeah how often do you work with companies or other leaders that struggle with a top performer i mean how how frequently in your career do people come and seek you out that's the biggest so far i've been out not even a year and i've that's the biggest <laughs> issue is how to deal with problem employees mm -hmm. and the pro i see that a lot of the uh, problem is that there is the structure is hey do your job there is no in briefing of how really to do your job and you're left to your own so you know that's when you're working eight hours a day um, you you know if you're bored you get on the internet and you know you're buying your wife some flowers or whatever you know so you're not really producing checking much. the score <laughs> right so um, there really has to be like the leader really needs to give you some left and right, right limits and challenge you and also let you know, hey, you're gonna make mistakes and yeah. I want you to make mistakes. Just don't make the same mistake. Yeah. Because that helps with experience. And when people are afraid to make mistakes, that's when the status quo work comes in. They're just gonna work the left and right, the minimum yeah. standard. So is there anything that you would recommend for leaders to do to help them mentally prepare for dealing with a problem employee. Yeah, uh, well, hopefully, as a leader, they would have dealt with this <laughs> in some hopefully. way or form, you know, even as a junior person having seen it, you know, and uh, the biggest thing they can do with a problem employee is, you know, at some point, you may have to take a senior leader, may have to cut through the shaft, get all the other leaders. Uh, from him to the problem person and just take that problem person under their own wing mm -hmm. and just give them because you may be the one that can give him the most uh, mentorship because um, there is really a lack of mentorship in a lot of workplaces so problem employee may be a star performer you know hidden in a cocoon right and you just need to bring it out uh, because the person definitely probably is not status quo work uh, and they may not be a worker that needs to be at that place at all, but it's up to you to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And having that mentoring and bringing them under your wing is what you're going to be doing. And some of the things you can do also to uh, help them out is, like you said, what, what do you do to challenge like an arrogant or mm -hmm. uh, person like that? And you can say, hey, you're going to do my job next week. You know, and just to give them that uh, oversight of, okay, wow, well, okay, I was in charge of three people and Jim is in charge of 60. Yeah. So now I'm in charge of 60 people. Whoa, this is a lot of paperwork. Well, this is a lot of stuff I need to do. You know, just to kind of give them a taste of, hey, this is what I do every day. This is what I got to look at. This is things I need to do. I need you eventually to be looking at this. And that's another uh, best practice is training the person below you to take your job. Mm-hmm. And people, some people, people go, well, that means that they're going to take my job. And I go, yeah, and that hopefully means that you're going to move up also. <laughs> you know, you got to go over to so, positive But manner. you can't move up if you're the only person who could do your job. Right, right, right. Something that just occurred to me, and we, we didn't talk about it in, in preparation for this, but um, it's always interesting. So we've been talking about, <clears throat> you know, how to deal with the problematic employee. Now we have to talk about, and it just occurred to me, we really need to address the environment too. Yeah. Because, you know, like, so go back to your initial example, you know, you had five guys and, you know, there's a lot of afterburner from the rumor mill 
that's come out never so this you got this one dude who's got this reputation of doing something from people that have either never personally experienced it or they've heard it you know translated 16,000 times over the course of a period of time managing the environment is is equally important as a leader as it is managing the actual individual as well and I think some I think I think that's an area of opportunity that I've seen a lot. I know personally, I, I made that mistake myself too. I didn't manage the environment. Once I figured out, I gotta, I gotta make sure that I snuff what's going on. I'm assuming it was the same thing in the teams too. Yeah, so it goes back to like the fit, right? Because uh, the environment is, like for us, it was like a troop. Mm -hmm. For a civilian sector, it's a department. And every department is different. Every team, every program is going to have their own little sub culture, you know, their right. personalities and good fit is big and understanding is more that you need to understand the environments. Cause when you have a top performer coming in and you're going to place them somewhere, you could set them up for failure by where you place them. Right. So you need it. And it may not be like, yeah, this person's from California. So I'm going to put them all with this team. That's all from California. That may not, I'm not saying to put them with like places. Right. It may be more of a challenge of, you know, hey, this person from California is going to go and work with every, this team that's everybody's from Texas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you're doing it for a reason, yeah. you know, and it may be a challenge. It may be to add some other incentive into that yeah. department. So uh, you just have to be aware of what you're doing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Take your time. Yeah. Yeah. Don't jump to it. Make it right. Either. Well, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank, yeah, thank you, you so much. You got anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you for having me out. Yeah, my pleasure. And we'll be talking again. Again, we got some other things planned up and lined up, and Actions On is doing really awesome. So, very cool stuff. Yeah, thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you again, Jim, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, we're excited to have you on board and uh, looking forward to. What is coming down the pike next that we have planned? You'll definitely hear more from him again. Jim works with executives and companies across the United States to help them improve on leadership and operational efficiencies within their workforce. If you'd like to connect with him, uh, please visit his website, Actions on Consulting, at actionson.net. Thank you again so much, Jim. I cannot begin to tell you how much I appreciate you spending time with us today. Jim's an awesome guy. He works with executives and companies across the United States to help them improve on leadership and operational efficiencies within their workforce. If you'd like to connect with Jim, visit his Actions on Consulting website at actionson.net and he'll be happy to talk to you a little bit more about some of the challenges that you're facing in your workforce and how you guys might be able to team up together and get some pretty pretty amazing knowledge in. So as we've talked about today, look, the practice of human resources doesn't have to be as arduous as it may appear. In the short time that we've been together, we've weeded through a few topics that make the landscape of human resources that moving target that we've talked about before. We're here to help you define your gold standard in human capital management and help you solve complex problems that come with employment and managing your people, as well as helping to keep you into the know on current or developing changes that are in the work employment landscape. Now, as promised earlier in the show, we, we do have a free resource for you. But first, before we do anything else, get out your pen, pencil, phone, computer, laptop, whatever you got, and mark your date, January 22nd, Tuesday, January 22nd. We're hosting a free webinar called Easy Compliance Wins. It's going to start at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we're going to be providing some best practices for to help you lock in your compliance requirements very quickly, efficiently, and maintain consistency. If you can't make the webinar, not a problem. It'll be available on demand, but you'll still, still need to register for it ahead of time. Also, we know how confusing it is to keep track of all of this compliance stuff and deadlines, and we're talking a lot about compliance these days, but we're in the perfect spot to do that because we're ending one year and starting another. So we know <clears throat> how long it takes to figure out all this stuff, all right? So what we've done 
is that we have created an HR calendar for 2019 that lists all the compliance deadlines to help relieve the tension of having to figure these things out yourself. The calendar includes mandatory filing deadlines, nationally recognized holidays, as well as a few best practice recommendations cast sprinkled in. It's a bunch of compliance information consolidated under one page. Print it, pin it up in your office, and use it as a tool to help you keep all the parts and pieces of the HR puzzle connected. To download this free tool, visit our website at bestpractices.work and click on the link at the bottom of the page. If you're struggling with a particular HR issue, look, reach out to us. We're, we're here to help you be successful. This is what we do. This is what we love doing. Um, you know, we've got the right tools, we've got the right knowledge, and we've got the right people in place to help you guys out. How you can go ahead and figure this out? <clears throat> Definitely start with the website. Check us out at bestpractices.work. On there, you are welcome to schedule a call with us. If you need to get on the line with a credentialed professional, you can go ahead and schedule a call with us very easily on the website. And if you want to do something bigger than just a short phone call to, you know, for Q&A and use somebody as a soundboard, that's fantastic. We're happy to go ahead and meet with you and actually do a needs analysis to identify some strategic opportunities that align with your human business, align with your business objectives. Um, if you don't have anything significant to speak with us about and scheduling our call or requesting a meeting is not necessary, not a problem. You can still follow us. Matter of fact, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and you can follow me on LinkedIn. So Instagram, you can find us on Best HR Practices. And Facebook, if you look us up as Best Practices, it's uh, I think it's Best Practices in HR is actually our, our little code.